Today on the Ministry Coach Podcast, we're going to talk about how as pastors, we need to be flock focused. How do we identify the wolves among our sheep and what can we do about it? Hey everybody, welcome to the Ministry Coach Podcast. My name is Jeff Lascola, and with me is the world's number one Dachshund fan. Wow, go Dachshunds! It sounds like a sports team. Kristen Lascola. <laughs> I am. I love Dachshunds. Little known fact, actually, widely known If you fact. know Kristen, you know she loves Dachshunds. <laughs> yeah. Wiener Big Dogs enthusiast. the late person. You know there's a lot of haters out there on Wiener Dogs. Yeah. Haters gonna hate. I don't know what to say. Check out my Instagram because you'll see our dachshund named Shortcake and you'll fall in love and you won't be able to hate anymore. They're a very comical breed, though. I think that's the thing is you can't you can't really take them seriously. If you've seen wiener dog races, you understand. <laughs> we this. do frequent the wiener dog races. So yeah. tonight's topic, you're at your youth group. There's that one kid or group of kids and you can tell you're not really here to hear the word of God or learn about God. You're here to what? Be a thorn in my side, <laughs> <laughs> to put it in biblical terms. Uh, Pick up on girls or... Get attention, steal the offering, yeah. smuggle the vape into the bathroom. I don't know. It could be a lot of things. So this whole episode is basically on how do you love the hard to love? And at what point does that become something where you have to cut bait on that? Yeah. And as I've been thinking through this question, you know, it's honestly one I've struggled with for the last, what, 16, 17 years of ministry. And I think it's one that I'm going to continue to struggle with. Um, and so anything said tonight, maybe you agree with, maybe you don't, we're all going to draw our line a little bit differently because I know where we're all coming from. We're all pastors and what do pastors love? Hopefully people. And so people is, um, people are people is <laughs> our business. It's what we do. Relationships are what we seek and sometimes the harder to love, we think the bigger the challenge. Let yeah. me like use my youth pastor superpowers <laughs> and I'm going to turn this kid around, you know? And I think there's part of us that likes a good challenge and we like to think, and I've seen this pattern in myself and in fellow youth pastors is we, we would like to think we're the person that's going to turn this person right. around or this group Oh, that. No, I just, no one's understood them up right. until this point, you know, and they've bounced from youth group to youth group, but I'm going to be the youth pastor. Yeah. That gets through their heart. And, and we really want to be, right. and for maybe some prideful reasons, but for some good reasons too. Like we always want to see people be restored and able to be a part of the body of Christ and that's our hope. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight is just navigating through some of those hard questions of what is our responsibility really, because we are in charge. The buck stops with us and what we allow and what we say no to and where we draw boundaries. Like that's a really hard job sometimes, yeah. um, with potentially some collateral damage and some fallout, that's sometimes just easier to avoid right. in all honesty. You know, I always kind of just like, we'll go to high school at some point <laughs> and then it won't be my problem anymore. Maybe I could just avoid it for two years. Right. So um, here's where we're going to start is a few episodes ago, I mentioned a book by Larry. If you're listening, I'm probably your number one fan. So Larry Osborne. Dachshunds, Larry Osborne. <laughs> Those two things. Muse and then Jeff. <laughs> um, so <laughs> just glad I made it on the list. <laughs> so Larry Osborne, he's a senior pastor of the church I work at, North Coast Church, and he wrote, I think it was his last book, actually, Lead Like a Shepherd. I ran into him the other day. I said, Larry, I hope you've been working on another book in quarantine. And he said, No. I feel kind of guilty about that. I was like, yeah, you should, because your number one fan's waiting for the next book. Have you ever seen the movie Misery or read the book by Stephen King? Yeah, with Kathy Bates? Yeah, you're Kathy Bates. 
Thank you. (laughs) Kathy, if you're listening, me and you, girl. Me and you. (laughs) I'm going to break his leg so he has to write me books. (laughs) Quarantine. (laughs) Sorry. Getting off topic. Dark turn. So Larry wrote this book called Lead Like a Shepherd. And one of the chapters speaks to this so well. Um, And so I'm going to pull some stuff from that. And then I'm going to filter it down through like more of a youth perspective because he's talking of like the congregation as a whole. So in his book, lead like a shepherd, he has a chapter called being flock focused and what that he's kind of setting the stage for us as pastors to take into consideration the health of the entire flock rather than just individual sheep and that we're sort of charged with this big responsibility. And he has some biblical um, backup for that, that we'll talk about in a second. But first, we're going to start with the question, what is the difference between a struggling sheep, if we're using the flock terminology, what is the difference between a struggling sheep and an infectious sheep? And he draws the distinction between the two of, well, a struggling sheep. I mean, our churches and our youth group are full of them, right? Mm -hmm. We are a struggling sheep. That doesn't sound (laughs) correct. (laughs) There's some like number pronouns that are weird in there, but um, (laughs) we are, we are struggling sheep, all of us, you know? And so the definition of a struggling sheep is someone who is going to battle with their sin. They see sin for what it is and they're not okay with it. They're struggling through it. They're not perfect, but the sin is a struggle, meaning that they're fighting it. They're Mm. going to battle with it. They're seeking accountability and they're aware of it and they're looking to change it and make it better. Right. Where is, whereas an infectious sheep has they're not fighting anymore. Mm. They've just allowed sin to just kind of be a part of their life. And even so far as to defending their sin, right. like they're not interested in changing it whatsoever. So Larry doesn't mention this, but as I'm saying it out loud, I almost wonder, you know, like a true believer will always struggle with sin. A true Christian will never be because of the conviction of the Holy spirit in their life, they will never just be okay with sin. There'll be seasons where they'll like keep their little pet sin around. You know, it could be a number of different things that they're not dealing with right away, Mm -hmm. but the, in their heart, they know it's wrong and they're not okay with it. So, but someone who's not a true believer, they're just like, yeah, I go to church because, you know, I enjoy it. I like my friends. I like what it has to offer, but I'm not going to change the way I'm living whatsoever. And so obviously God is going to judge the heart, but I think you could kind of make an argument there like true believer versus maybe not a true believer. So this infectious lamb, they have started defending their sin. And Larry makes the case that like, okay, well, it's time to be quarantined. (laughs) The book was ahead of its time. (laughs) You know, they need to be quarantined. And so as shepherds, that's us, the pastors. Now we have this really big, heavy responsibility that all of us unless you're some kind of like person that just loves conflict, um, we really try to avoid that Mm -hmm. situation and we kind of hope it'll just go away on its own. Um, and we can kind of get hesitant to remove the toxic or infectious sheep. But Larry makes a really good point that not only is it harmful to your church, to your youth group, to your small group, to your congregation, whatever, but it's contagious. Oh yeah. So that kind of should light a fire under us a little bit for these infectious sheep. Like you are like, think of that word infectious, like you spread stuff around. And so he says, we don't want to do this for two reasons. We don't want to deal with the problem. Number one, because we confuse love with looking the other way. And number two, we fear collateral damage. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of us can probably relate to both of those, but let me read you something from Titus three, 10 through 11. It says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. 
after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. And I really like this verse because it kind of now I want to take a turn to focus a little bit more on youth ministry. Mm -hmm. And I always say once is a bad day. You did something you aren't proud of. Once is a bad day. Uh, I'm going to overlook that. And I don't think it's you. Number two, the second time it happens, I might give a consequence of like, all right, like we've already talked about this third time. It's a pattern. And then we move to something more drastic depending on what the offense is. And that's why it's a little hard to talk about this because it's so... Um, painting with a really broad brush. There's so many different things it could be. Right. Like it's been, you're sent out of your small group and then we've gone all the way to, you're not welcome here anymore. You know, like, and there's everything in between. And so what we, well, I was thinking more for what they're doing. Right. You know, those consequences, you're constantly interrupting and talking versus you're bringing drugs and weapons to youth group. You know, I mean, there's a big difference. There is. Oh, of course. But they both obviously are are disruptive and can be problems. So how you deal with them obviously is going to be different too. But yeah. And I think when we sit down and like talk to the person, so the next verse I want to bring up is Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And this is the one I probably won't read it because this is the one you guys all know about, you know, when you're dealing with conflict, first you go to that person. Mm -hmm. And then if they won't listen to you, you bring someone else along and you confront them together. And then if they still won't listen to you, you bring them to the church. And then if they still won't, then it's like toodaloo, like you have no interest in being a part of the body of Christ. So, so I think once you start that like conflict strategy with them, Mm -hmm you'll, you'll pick up so quick on where their interest level in changing is, yeah. you know, like if you talk to the student, I, I asked a couple students to leave with me and Hey, meet me outside. You know, I want to talk to you guys. Cause they were being pretty mean to another kid. One of them was a kid's brother, but I just was like, you know, I can't his own brother. Yeah. Okay. And then a friend. And so I said, Hey guys, like the way you're talking to him, like, I can tell you're making him feel really bad, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you could just tell they felt bad. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, shoot, you know, we shouldn't have said that. Okay, like, we'll try. And so at that point, you're like, okay, that's a struggling sheep. Mm -hmm. You know, you will know so much based on their initial response to you of where this is going to go, of whether they're just like, you can't tell me what to do, or I didn't mean that. Or a big red flag for me is when they keep lying while you're you're confronting them and it's just lie after lie after lie. And it's just like, you're not, we're not g- getting anywhere. Right. Um, and those are usually the ones that eventually I've had to do some like harsher discipline with of like, well, okay, you're going to take a break next week, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's a pretty rare occasion that it's like, you are literally not welcome here yeah. anymore. In 17 years, I've done that twice. And you hope it wouldn't, wouldn't ever come to that, but sometimes right. it warrants that. And and one thing that to look for is this like an offense that is dangerous, right. you know, to your students or to themselves um, or very dangerous to the culture. Like maybe it's not like an actual knife or gun threat or something like that, but they're just so toxic to your culture. Yeah. And some of those kids, you can use their superpowers for good, like if they're have a lot of influence. You yeah, mean? yeah, exactly. If they are the high influencer, but they're influencing everyone from bad, sometimes you can just grab them and like, Hey, you know what? You are such a leader. Can you help me lead? But I need you to lead in this way. And you kind of pull them into the inside and some kids will, will respond to right. that. I've tried that tactic. Sometimes it works. And then other kids, they're like, forget right. you. I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want. And I'm bringing them with me. And those are the times where you're like, all right, well then this might not be the place for you. Right. And those are the experiences sometimes too, where you know, when they are not there one night and all of a sudden you're like, it was such a different atmosphere Oh yeah, because that one catalyst wasn't there spurring other people it's on incredible, and whether it's, I don't want to play the game. So these other 25 people aren't going to play either because he's not playing. Right. Or if it's just attitudes or just things like that, but then they're not there and you're like, 
it was Amazing. night and day. Yeah. And for youth, it's a lot different because I think we have a harder time, like looking at Larry's model for this. It's so brilliant, but kids are like, like if an adult were to act like that, you would be like, Okay. Okay, <laughs> sir. Hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to have you that. You need talk. to get out of here. But we are also doing some child rearing and that's a lot different because they're not fully developed yet. And so yeah. the way that they act is kind of like off a lot right. of times. And so we're steering them in the right direction. So like what is toxic in terms of like speaking about just youth, like we definitely do have a different line mm -hmm. of what is okay and what is not. So I think what I'm constantly praying is the same prayer that Solomon prayed is just wisdom, 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 please, please give me wisdom because I don't always know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many podcasts I listen to, how many books I read, how many other youth pastors I talk to, like every situation is just so different. But here's the bottom line is that we really need courage to do the right thing. Because if you're not acting because you don't know what to do, keep asking, keep seeking help keep praying on it. But if you're not acting because you're afraid of the collateral damage and we'll kind of move into that now is like now we're not being good leaders right. or good stewards, because here's the collateral damage. If you ask a student not to come back anymore, like you're, I'm sorry. Like I, I've told a student once I said, I just don't trust you. We had a lot of different run-ins about the same thing and he lied constantly. And, um, I even tried to involve his parents and it just wasn't, we weren't making progress. I said, you know, I just can't have you here anymore because I can't trust you. I was afraid of, because he was part of a huge group of mm. friends, you know, and so what are they going to do now? Are you going to lose a huge portion? Of yeah. Your youth group? And he was influential and, you know, I didn't know how his parents were going to respond. I've, you know, asked a student to step down from a leadership position because of um, some bad moral choices. I didn't kick her out of church. I just said, you can't be on leadership anymore. And her mom went ballistic, right. you know? And so I had to deal with now and I write parent. And so sometimes we just out of fear, we don't want to act because we're just like, Oh, like everyone's going to be mad or it's going to create more conflict. And we try to like put it off. So I guess ask yourself the question, am I not acting because I'm afraid or am I not acting because I'm not exactly sure what to do? And that's an okay place to be. Just keep seeking advice. Maybe talk to your senior pastor, like, Hey, here's what's going on. What would you do? Mm -hmm. Maybe talk to their small group leader. Um, they'll give you some insight on that kid. Maybe you have some more conversations with that student and try to get a vibe of like, where is their heart? Is this something that is wise for me to continue in on? You can take your time, mm -hmm. but be careful because you know, some of the sin, I mean, it's really contagious. And if you, kind of like what you're saying, you can watch the whole dynamic of your group change because of one wolf, one punk, yeah. one jerk who has no interest in what you're doing. And I often think of that verse of throwing your pearls before swine. Like the Bible says, like if you've given them the gospel, if you've given them love, if you've given them chances and you just keep throwing out this beautiful jewels and they just keep trampling and act, you know, it's, the Bible says is stop. Right. But I, there's just this side of us that we think Jesus had an infinite amount of patience right. with people, but he didn't No, He did have a lot of patience. I mean, when you watch him interact with people, but he also had a point where he was like enough. Right. And I think we always fear like, well, we're not being loving. And, you know, people will throw it in our face. Like, aren't you supposed to be a pastor? The church is supposed to love and accept everyone. And then we kind of question ourselves of like, was I too quick to act? Was I too harsh? Like why, you know, and it's so hard to know when the right move is. So here's a, cu a couple things I thought of maybe to help you know when it's time to really act. They constantly lie to get out of trouble uh, they don't own up to any correction or make any strides to incorporate correction into their life. They're not teachable on any level after multiple attempts. What they're doing is harmful or dangerous to themselves or others. They are living in high-handed sin, 
yet claim to be a Christian, yet justify their sin over and over again and bring others down with them. Those are some real red flags. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe the, and those are the ones that I think are like, whoa, it might be time for like a break um, for for them to kind of assess, do you really want to be here? Cause we're throwing pearls before swine every right. week. And then the other ones, there's some kids it's like, Oh, they're so disruptive. Oh, they're talking every week. Now that's a, probably a different discussion. And that's just the art of discipline, but like squirrely kids who have good hearts that are just driving everyone <laughs> insane. Um, that is not what we're talking about. Yeah. These are people who are toxic, who are infectious, who are, are bringing sin into the camp that are making peace with sin and have no, like we have kids that it's like the, the whole worship message, small group, they're like, I want a place to skate. I want girls that I can, you know, pick up on and I want a bathroom I can smoke in. And that's what they use us for, you know, and we can try to reach them night one. I'm not going to be like, I don't think you're here for the right reasons. You're going to get out of my youth group. You know, we try to reach them. We try and I'm not going to kick you out. Everyone's welcome at church. But when you get to a toxic, if you won't put your phone away, if you're constantly bringing vape, if you're like destroying property, if you're stealing stealing things, if you won't listen to authority or respect authority, if you won't play by our rules that are very simple, it's not, you don't have to play every game. You don't have to raise your hands during worship. You don't have to, you know, sing every song, but you do have to follow the rules. Mm. And if you can't do that, this may not be the place for you. So I don't know. Is that too vague? No, I don't think so. And I'm sure everybody probably can think of some students that would fall into that category. It's a fine line, though, because the youth group or the youth night is made to be fun. It's made to be welcoming. It's made to be inviting. And you're attracting these kids. You're attracting all kids. And that's what you want to do is have them to get them in and then to be able to preach the gospel. And and for those that are already Christians, you're discipling them. For those that don't know God, you're, you know, you're looking to outreach to them and, and bring them into the flock. But there are those kids, I feel like, that don't look at it like this is a youth group. This is a hangout. Mm -hmm. And they do get to, like you're saying, like they're not there for the message. They're not there for the worship or, you know, the small groups, anything like that. And they get to a point where they think you're out of line because you're bringing my good time down. (laughs) This is our hangout. What are you talking? Like, why do you keep wasting our time with the Bible when we're here to hang out? And And if they were silently stewing and didn't like every time she preaches, I just zone out okay, fine. Do whatever you want. It's when you go to a level of disrespect, disruption, um, destruction, Ooh, a lot of D words in there. (laughs) Alliteration. You know, that's when it's like, Whoa, you know, but if you're just here and you're bored out of your mind, but you, you know, come that's fine. You don't have to participate and be like, pick me. Like I want to be on stage. Like you don't have to be that kid. But if you are exhibiting those other behaviors, you know, and bringing us down, then and, yeah. the, and the whole idea of, you know, games and community building in our last episode, we talked about the youth room design and setup and how all of that is designed for bringing students in, making it a welcoming environment for them. So they'd become part of the community, become part of the flock in order to disciple them. And you have these certain kids that don't want any part of any of the God portions of youth group, which is the most important. Mm-hmm. It all of a sudden makes them feel like, well, maybe this isn't cool. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I mean, the complete opposite of what you want to have happen. You want, you want your group to be the place where when that wolf in sheep's clothing comes, hopefully they will turn and, and start following these other kids and this other community that you've built. But sometimes that influence can be so dramatic that unless you put a stop to it, they just going to slowly or quickly drag your entire youth group down. And that's just, it's a horrible place to be because then you, you dread going. I know some of the students dread going and unless you're going to be, you know, courageous and strong enough to put an end to it. Right. It just builds on it. And that's what I was going to say. I was going to say in all of this conversation, I think the bottom line is, are we having bold leadership to say, And have the, so bold leadership and discernment. Mm -hmm. So discernment to know when it's time to take action and then the boldness to actually do it and not confuse. Oh, I just love them. 
you know, with well, looking the other way, it's like, Oh, like, we're just going to love them. We're right. just going to love them. No, they'll come around. We're just going to love them. While like you said, all these other kids are frustrated. Like I've had kids like I hate small group now, right. you know, because this person disrupts everything or I don't want to raise my hands during worship because this person's going to think I'm lame. Right. And I've had kids do that. They'll make fun of, they'll like mock kids. Oh, and if I catch them, it just, even now, like replaying it in my head, you know, it's just makes me so angry. And so it's like the mockers, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just like, oh, curious. I've never been to church. Like, what do we do? I'm not really into it, but like, I'm respectful, but it's those mockers, Mm -hmm. you know, that it's just like, we have to protect our flock from them to create a place where people can worship because yes, church is outreach and that is part of it, but church is also discipleship. And so church is for non-Christians who are curious and, but church is a place for Christians that we need to protect. Mm -hmm. And so the leader balancing that that's an art. I'm not saying like, here's the formula. It's easy. It's not. And you take it case by case, the discernment of the Holy spirit, but going off of scripture too, you know, the church in Corinth, when that guy was sleeping with his father's wife, you know, I guess it was a stepmom because it didn't say his mother, which is great because that would have taken a whole other turn (laughs) of a story. But, and they were just kind of looking the other way. And Paul's like, what are you confusing here? Like, you can't just say, well, we love this guy, you know, like it's sin, call it what it is and get rid of it. Like if he's in the church and he's doing this, like get rid of it. You need to be flock focused. You need to focus on the health of the flock and not compromise that for one sheep. And so as youth pastors, it's going to be tough, right? you know, because we, we always think we're going to be that, that person's going to tell their testimony someday. They're going to say, and it was him or it was her and that, and we just want to be a part of that story of like, I never gave up on this kid. And meanwhile, the flog is like, help us (laughs) like we're suffering. And so sometimes putting our own pride aside to say like, I just have to be Paul here and say enough. Yeah. I get it. Like I see how it's like, you don't want to give up on somebody. And we've talked before where if they, if it's a kid that has gone to youth group to youth group and just keeps on getting kicked out and you want to be that person that, you know, brings them to, to Jesus, or you think, I don't want them to ever look back at their experiences at church and, and, think that's why I'm not a Christian or that's why yeah. I wouldn't ever, you know, come to accept Jesus is because how I was treated in, in these youth groups and in church. But sometimes it comes to that where you're like, I don't think they're going to turn. They're not going to make that 180. Well, at least not now and not right. in these circumstances. And so I think, it might not be their time. And right. I told some of my leaders that before of like, I know like you love this kid it just might not be their time, mm-hmm. you know? And it, uh, and when we say not everything qualifies as like kick them out, right. you know, it's just like, it might need some boundaries or discipline and stuff like that. But we had a kid last year who was just a wreck. He was like, you know, he would be disruptive and all of this. And just one day he came up to me, he's like, God talked to me this morning. I want to be baptized. He said, <laughs> what are you going to choose? And I was like, what the heck? And I, I, we baptized him at camp and it was amazing, you know, and it, he was one that took a really yeah. long time and he was kooky, but he was never like a mocker, like a right. jerk. You know, he was just like kind of marching to the beat of his own drum. You could tell he was kind of like doing his own thing, but not in a like, you guys suck kind of way. Mm -hmm. It was just like, there he is doing his thing. You know, I mean, it is really case by case and that's why we need the discernment of the Holy spirit and bold leadership. What would you say are some of the steps you might take? This is talking about the ones that are the more of a hardcore problem. What are usually the steps you would take if it did come to, I'm sorry, you can't come back. And, and how, how would you say that to them? But also what are the steps you would take to even get to that point? Like, you need to take a break for a week or yeah, how that- I've always given them like a time. So I always do the initial confrontation of like, Hey, you know, the way you're acting is blah, 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 blah. Whatever the situation is, it's just one-on-one me and them. And then, you know, if it's persisting and it's not getting any better, then I will say, Hey, you know, 
I think it's time that you took a little break. So depending on what's happened, I'll either say, um, I don't want to see you next week. I want you to think about some stuff. And if this is really the place that you want to be on Tuesday nights, um, and then I want to see you back the following week and I'd love to talk about it. And so I always kind of like give them that chance of like, mm-hmm. Hey, you you just got a detention or a suspension, right. you know? And then if they come back and things still aren't changing and there's no heart change and there's no, then yeah, I have, I like to involve the parent right. at that point, you know, and probably even with the suspension, I involve the parent of like, so hey, they know why they're yeah. all of a sudden not allowed back for one week. Exactly. Like, Hey, I asked so-and-so like not to come back next week. Here's why. And then if it ever comes down to they're not welcome here anymore, I obviously involve the parent and say, and, and that's hard because sometimes these kids, especially the ones that act like this, they don't have involved parents. Yeah. And so even getting a hold of a parent has been really challenging. Like I've been like lied to, oh, this is my mom's phone number and it, it's not, it's like some random person or whatever, but even getting a hold of a parent can be hard sometimes, but that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Hey, and I've even told kids who I've said, I don't want to see like, you're not welcome here. I've said, but after a time, if your mom or parents, whoever are willing to sit down and talk the three of us, I'll consider, I'll consider reversing this. Mm-hmm. But you have to put in the work of like setting up the meeting and, you know, I'd like to see where you're at. So I very rarely am like, you are banished right. forever. But I say right now, this isn't a good place for you. It's not, a, it's not good for you. It's not good for us. But if you're willing to have a meeting, you know, and sometimes they will, sometimes they won't, they act like they want. And it, and that shows how bad they want to come back. Right. You know, if they're willing to set up a meeting with their parents and me, and we sit down and we all get on the same page, but like for youth, you really need parent buy-in and the two kids in my 17 years that I've asked not to come back. I never, I, one of them wanted to come back, but he wasn't willing to do the parent meeting. And the other one, the mom was like, yep, totally understand. Thanks. Bye. You know? So, I mean, it's sad. I never right. feel like good. Like, but those you circumstances know? too, you never left. It was not bad blood. It was very clearly laid out. Here's right. the criteria. Here's the expectations we have. And if you're not willing to do that, it's kind of like your choice. What do you want to do? Yeah. And that was what they chose basically. Definitely. You know, and it breaks my heart, like, but I think of like all my other kids and I don't want to break their heart by putting them in a situation where they're not growing and Mm -hmm. they're distracted and they're not learning. They're afraid they're being made fun of. And you're investing so much of that time that you could be discipling them into reprimanding and, you know, these other kids. And so, and then, you know, you have to, at the end of the day, say I did everything, Right. you know, and if you really can say that I did everything do your best and then move on. You know, sometimes it's just, we have to move on. We're not going to save every kid. We're not going to turn every kid around. We might be a a part of their story. Who knows what God, God's not done with them, but this chapter might be done for them and we have to be okay with that. Yeah. Everyone coming to know Christ is going to be, you're a link in their chain. Yeah. My thought was always just don't be the weakest link. Be oh. this, as strong of a link as you can. I like that. And do your best, you know, your part. And definitely don't be the link that breaks it, but. Right. Like just, I gave you everything. I gave you every opportunity to succeed and you chose not to every time. I can't choose differently for you, mm-hmm. you know, but I have to stand up now and say enough. And I'm sorry. It's the whole idea of, um, Come as you are, but you're, you're not expected to stay as you are. Totally. And if they're not willing to do that, then that's a ghost for all of us, though, too. Right. So, All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time. Thanks for checking out this episode. We hope that it provided a ton of insight for you to create health in yourself, your ministry, and your church. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the Ministry Coach Podcast wherever you're watching or listening. And it would mean so much to us if you would rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts. And we'd also encourage you to share it with a friend so that it can go to help more people. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.